All right, let's dig deeper into the uh, market reaction to today's jobs data and any number of other things that Sarah just introduced as important subjects as well. Our next guest says there's no room for error in the current market valuations, and investors should consider the realities of an economy under stress. Joining us now is Morgan Stanley Wealth Management Chief Investment Officer Lisa Chalette. Lisa, um, why do you feel that way? Let's just start there. Uh, you know, look, I mean, this continues to be a market that uh, is selling at a forward price earnings multiple uh, of almost 19.3 times forward, which is where we were when 10-year real rates were sub 1%. Uh, the 10-year real rate today is 2%. Uh, and, in, uh, and in the long run, uh, you know, valuations tend to follow uh, real rates. And I think one of the things that uh, has decoupled here in the current environment is financial conditions have not been following real interest rates since the middle of the year. And this has been the conundrum for the Fed. They have kind of lost control a little bit uh, of actual tightening. Uh, and the fact is, is that the liquidity environment for this economy remains as accommodative, uh, quite frankly, as it's been, uh, you know, for over a year. Uh, yes, we've had moments of, of tightening of financial conditions from July 31st to October 31st. Uh, but as we know from the month of November, that has proved extraordinarily short lived. Why? Because we've had this wild uh, um, and unpredicted fall in uh, in oil prices down 27 percent. I think that's one of the, you know, underpinnings of this, you know, sudden shift in consumer sentiment and, and inflation expectations. Uh, and we've had oil prices decouple from the dollar. Right. And so all of these things uh, have loosened financial conditions and uh, while the Fed wants to be tight and wants to, quote unquote, stay on hold, uh, I just don't see any way that they can move towards cutting uh, with financial conditions where they are. Interesting. Lisa, on the valuation front, you know, there are those who would point to the seven stocks that represent, what, 29, 30 percent of the market cap. Now, some of them have lower, uh, not particularly high multiples, but a couple have fairly high multiples. When you look at the other 493 uh, companies or stocks in the S&P, you get a lower multiple. And, you know, what do you make of that bifurcation? Is there a, a case to be made for, you know, going after perhaps some of the lower multiple and or the broader market that doesn't include the big seven? Uh, yeah, 100 uh, percent, David. I, I think that that uh, has certainly been our perspective all year. We've been recommending uh, you know, more of a blend between the market cap weighted index and, and the S&P 500 equal weighted index uh, for passive investors and a more active approach for those who want to stock pick. Uh, because to your point, uh, those other 493 names are selling at a much more reasonable and coherent and analytically grounded multiple of, you know, somewhere between 16 and 17 times forward. Uh, and that does make sense to us. And so, um, the the concentration that we're seeing in the Magnificent Seven uh, was last seen kind of back in, in 1998. We know that this type of concentration uh, tends not to be uh, permanent, uh, and ultimately it gets undermined. And, you know, our best guess is that if, in fact, uh, the Fed does begin to cut rates at, at some point. It's not going to be these defensive, uh, you know, secular growth Teflon names uh, that are going to lead the market. It's going to be more value-oriented, cyclical-type companies that have deeply sold off. Uh, so financials, industrials, some of the discretionary uh, spaces, some of the, the, the small and mid-cap uh, spaces are, are where we're searching uh, for value in anticipation of that ultimate shift and rebalancing and leadership. 